Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming tonight and joining us. Um, I'm Julie Dickover, the director of the Chris Beller Art Museum here at Flagler. And as you know, this symposium was organized in conjunction with our current exhibition titled Rewriting History from the Matanzas Bay, sorry, from the Southern Plains to the Matanzas Bay. Um, and this is an exhibition in which the curators Emily Arthur, Marwan Begay, and John Hitchcock have been working on for several years. Emily first approached me about hosting the exhibition back in 2012, and so it's really great to see everything come together and to have this finally happen, um, since we've been working on this symposium for such a long time. Um, before I introduce Emily, I have a few thank yous. Um, I would first of all like to thank Flagler College for all of their support with the museum's programming as well as the City of St. Augustine and the 450th Commemoration for helping to promote the symposium and the exhibition. Um, the Community Foundation for Northeast Florida has been a really great help and has generously supported this exhibition with a grant from the Joanne Chris Beller Fund. Um, the curators have also received research support from the University of Wisconsin-Madison through the Arts Institute Creative Arts Award and the Graduate School Research Grant. Um, I would always also like to thank the Castillo de San Marcos and the St. Augustine Historical Society who generously loaned several original ledger drawings and photographs to the exhibition next door. Um, and then finally, I wanted to let everybody know about another small exhibition that was developed by Dr. Kelly Enright here at Flagler in conjunction with students from the Public History Program. It's located at the Proctor Library two doors down, um, and it's about American Indian, the history of American Indians and the Castillo de San Marcos. Um, it explores this hidden history, and we welcome anyone to visit. It's in the um, display cases as you walk into the building to the right during regular business hours, so that's before 6 p.m. Um, okay, so now I would like to introduce Emily Arthur, who is acting today as the symposium panel chair. She is also the project director and co-curator for Rewriting History. Um, Emily is an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she teaches printmaking, printmaking in the Art Depart Department of Art. Emily served as associate professor of art here at uh, the University of North Florida for 13 years before relocating last fall to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Arthur received an MFA from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in Pennsylvania and has served as a fellow at the Barnes Foundation for Advanced theoretical and critical research, also in Pennsylvania. Additional, additional education includes the Rhode Island School of Design and the Tamarin Institute of Lithography in the, at the University of New Mexico. Arthur is a recipient of a Florida Artist Enhancement Grant provided by the State of Florida and the National Endowment for the Arts and is awarded to the Notable Women in the Arts, the National Museum of Women in the Arts, her work is included in the permanent collections of the Museum of Contemporary Native Art, the Tweed Museum of Art, the Denver Art Museum, Liefer Erickson Foundation, and is held in international collections from all over the world in Russia, Estonia, Japan, New Zealand, United Kingdom, Italy, and France. And I just, you know, again, I wanted to thank all of the panelists for coming um, to St. Augustine and joining us. It's been really wonderful to work with everybody. And a special, special thanks to Emily and John and Marwin for curating and bringing to us such a special exhibition. So please join me in welcoming Emily. So along with that, as most of you probably know, there's been an ongoing symposium today. So we've had speakers that started at 10 this morning. And I just wanted to recognize our other panelists, if you're willing to stand with us just for a second. So um, Harry Mythalo, Nancy Mythalo, and Juanita Pataponi spoke this morning. And this afternoon, we had Heather Octone, John Hitchcock, and Marwin Begay. So I, I, again, with Julie, welcome everyone here, and I thank you for joining with us tonight because it's a really intimate crowd, and I'd love to, um, to see this and sort of charge you with the responsibility of taking all of this information out into your own community, your own life, and that you're the carriers of this. 
um, really for the rest of the year, right? For the whole 450th. So, so we're expecting big things from you. <laughs> and I invite you to see yourself as part of the symposium and that your collaboration is to reconsider our shared American history. We offer you an indigenous perspective while acknowledging forgotten histories. Please know that the weight of this shared American history is so great that not one work of art next door and not one exhibition can carry this history alone. As a professor in Florida, my initial plan was to introduce my students, just one class, to a part of our St. Augustine history that was not in the books. And I think that most of you would agree that true teaching often, it just has to be smuggled into the classroom a lot of times. So what began as curriculum has become a very meaningful seven years of research working with artists and historians, many of whom have relatives that were imprisoned here at Fort Marion. And what I learned from the descendants of, in Oklahoma is that they know far more about St. Augustine, Florida than our community knows about them. This morning, we heard family stories from Harry Mythlow, Nancy Mythlow, and Juanita Pataponi. And this afternoon, we examined the artwork as a contemporary response to this historic event with Heather Otto and John Hitchcock and Marlon Begay. And tonight we'll hear from Willie Johns and Edgar Heaperbirds. This story of St. Augustine is a story of many different native peoples. Chiricahua Apache, Cheyenne, Comanche, Kiowa, Arapaho, Caddo, and the Seminole people were all here imprisoned at Fort Marion and subject to military control. It was here it was here in St. Augustine that the U.S. military developed assimilation methods to systematically carry out the total eradication of another culture by force. These assimilation methods developed at Fort Marion define a century of government policy and were institutionalized in the federal boarding school policy for children, specifically the Carlisle Indian School, where Lieutenant Richard Henry Pratt coined the phrase, kill the Indian to save the man. With this exhibition, we remember, we put back together, we remember they were not simply prisoners. These hundreds of men, women, and children were husbands, fathers, mothers, and daughters, and their humanity exceeds the designation of prisoner. This history is not over, but is present in the land which holds a memory specific to this place. This history is carried within the many families affected by imprisonment and the thousands of boarding school children who define their experience as a cultural genocide. When we view history as circular and not linear, we discern how earlier events affect our present. The native, native reading of time is like a spiral. It's always turning in on itself, continuously circling to the same moment, reinscribing these events with new insights so I'm hoping for tonight, let us listen for these new insights and celebrate the cultural exchange that continues to be alive and vital in the voices who bring the continued history despite the efforts of colonization. Our first speaker tonight is Willie Johns. Willie is a Seminole tribe of Florida citizen and he lives on the Brighton Seminole Indian Reservation. As a Seminole Tribal Florida cultural specialist, he delivers lectures and workshops about Seminole tribal culture and history to tribal and non-tribal communities. After working as an advocate towards the formation of a Seminole Tribal Florida's own court system, he was recently appointed as Chief Justice of the Seminole Tribal Florida Court. Please help me welcome Willie Johns. Good evening, everybody. I was appointed uh, Chief Justice of the Seminole Tribe. I'm going on my second year, and uh, we've been developing our court. And uh, we have Chief Judge, and um, we have uh, regular judges under him, and I'm the appellate court. And I have two other judges under me. And. Um, I'm going to tie my, my talk into the, the legal system of uh, Native people because, you know, um, you, 
as, as you uh, walk through the uh, art gallery, you notice that uh, there was no Seminole painting on the wall. And uh, that reason is because we were here in prison for a different reason. We were prisoners of war, and we were handled much different. We weren't brought here to be assimilated. We were brought here to be deported to Indian territory. So we didn't have that uh, assimilation. So ours is very different. Our, our mentality of how we think about it is very different. And uh, so prisoners of war, combat, Seminoles, you know, Osceola was held here, held here, Wildcat, there was the great escape story. But the, here's, here's the thing, the Seminoles didn't go to the reservation until 1930s. Like all my other brothers in the West, they've been on reservations for almost 100 years. They've been dealing with the white man that long. And so we were, we were the native people were United States' big problem. They didn't know how to deal with this, you know. The assimilation did not work. And they tried, and then after we were put on the reservation in the 1930s, my people, in like 1936, were sent to, they weren't sent to boarding school. You, you uh, volunteered. And uh, as far as we went was Cherokee, North Carolina. And we were taught given an education and then by the early after the after world war ii we were uh they built bia schools on the reservations so our children didn't have to leave now i wanted to tie this in because with the the carlisle schools there was the, there was a lot of, a lot of problems that came out of that, and a, a lot of good things that came out of it, but it came out of spilt blood by these native kids. You know, we don't, there was a lot of, there was a lot of death in those, those schools, because they talked about diseases coming there, you know, like pneumonia, and it would wipe out a lot of kids. We don't hear that story but we hear the success. And then a lot of the kids were farmed out to big ranches and they were treated like slaves, you know, and they worked for the rancher and the farmers and they, then they were brought back to school. And as they were growing up, they, and they had to go somewhere, you know, they, so they would go back to their reservations, and a lot of times they would go to their reservation and they weren't claimed by their own people because they couldn't talk the language, you know, and uh, so they lived outside. And so the trickle down of these uh, Carlisle Indian schools and stuff brought in a new law called ICWA, and that's the uh, Native, Native Indian Children Welfare Administration. And, that, and a lot of that falls into our court system because out of these uh, boarding schools and stuff, we have kids that were brought up and they're, they're, they're lost. They're lost. So they, we call them the lost children. And, and they come in and they're coming into our courts now. And uh, we have to decide. And we, a lot of the kids were adopted out, you know. You, you know, they had 10 kids, say, and they would just give them to people. You know, you want a kid? Sure, we, we got an Indian boy here. You can take him and raise him. And so they were brought up white. But yet, they, they didn't look the same. You know, they, as they grew up, they, they looked at their stepfathers and stepmothers, and they looked at them and say, hey, I don't look the same, you know, I, I'm different, you know. And uh, so this law was enacted by Congress, ECWA, 
to protect, to stop these adoptions by non-native non people and put the power back into the people, to the native tribes, so they can take care of their own. And so today, that's what we have in our court system today, and we see a lot of it because, uh, you know, we have the problem just like any other community. We have the alcohol and the drugs and stuff, but I think sometimes natives people may be a little bit stronger because of that non-assimilation that they did, I mean, they assimilated. And now they're trying to assimilate back into their native tribes, try to relearn their language, and try to learn their customs, and it's not working. And uh, I see it on our, my own reservation because we, we have a uh, charter school, and uh, we, we control everything. The whole education system, we write all the curriculum. And we teach our, our, my native language is the Creek language, Cow Creek of uh, the Seminoles. And uh, so that, that's one of our main language that we speak. And we, that's who, what we talk, teach in school. And, and so in our culture, and uh, so we try to keep our kids on the res as long as we can. But you know that, uh, that American dream, it just pulls them. You know, they want to they, they want to be white. So it is, it's just real tough. And uh, so the challenge is there for all Native people, you know, that, that ongoing assimilation because of America is becoming this one big old mixing bowl, you know. I used to teach history and I'd, I'd draw a picture of a big old pot. And I would, and I would ask the, my students, I said, now, where are we? And they'd come up and they'd point, you know, we're here. We're not quite in the pot. And we'd, we'd identify people who we thought were in the pot, you know, and already mixed up. And we were on the top, fixing to fall in. <laughs> so, so we try to teach those kids, our, our native kids, anything we can in our, you know, whatever it is, in our native ways. And, uh, and we're starting to get our kids that are, that has been adopted out. You know, we're starting to fight for them and get them back and, and re-indoctrinate them sort of say. And uh, so that, that big fort there wasn't, you know, uh, our enemy as, but it, as time has grown it, you know, it has. And uh, so, anybody have any questions? <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I knew you would ask me something. Get up, ask me. Well, uh, uh, not a question, but the, there's a the difference is the recognized tribe and Seminole tribe, we are uh, indigenous people remain, not giving up our rights, never signed a peace treaty. We still hold on to our land, we still hold on to our cultures. And he's not speaking for us. So that's why I'm here to make sure correct this. So we're still here and we still live in our land. So we need to respect what you're serving because God's creation disappeared. And maybe like 10 years or 15, 20 years more, we all going to struggle what your damage is. What uh, for he started the uh, corruption in this land. So you need to control yourself. What you're doing to your 
our land. So he's speaking for the people on reservation. With that. Thank you. Yes. You mentioned uh, in the 1930s and that I wondered whether the uh, Indians were uh, asked to or forced to serve in the world in the World War. Not until. Some of them did. They uh, served out uh, of World War II. And uh, I think it, it was, I only know of two men that served. American Indians serve in higher numbers in the U.S. military than any other, quote, ethnic minority in America. There's a great history there. And if you want sources, I'm happy to provide them. Yes, sir. Can you tell us a little bit about your religion? Well, um, we we do have a religion, and uh, it's uh, we celebrate in the middle, early spring, and it, and uh, it's called a green corn dance, and uh, that's about all I want to tell you is that we do have a celebration, and uh, and it's annual. You know, it's about the harvest of the corn. There's two recognized tribes in the state of Florida, it's the Miccosukees and the Seminoles, federally recognized. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about your uh, judicial or legal system and what, what goes on? Well, we're real brand new, so uh, that's easy, you know, we, we're, uh, in our Constitution, the Seminole Tribes Constitution, we uh, were supposed to develop the court system about 50 years ago, but we ignored it. <laughs> but in order to, in order to uh, really say you're a sovereign nation, you have to be able to rule over your people. And uh, so, that's why it's important that we we had to develop our court system. And uh, most right now, our court system is civil, civil crimes, and we're going to be doing some divorces, and and uh, and it's you know like general arguments between tribal people over who knows you know just whatever is civil. So that's the way our court is going to do, is starting out. But eventually, as we grow, we're going to incorporate criminal, the criminal cases also. Yes, sir. In the stories that you tell uh, uh, about St. Augustine, you know, when, 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 you, when you gather as a people and you tell stories about St. Augustine and about Fort Marion, uh, what are the stories that you tell? What, what is the perspective of, we're celebrating here 450 years of the city and we just celebrated 500 years of the discovery of Florida. Uh, how do you tell that story? Well, mostly it's uh, the capture under a white flag and then imprisonment, and then the great escape. Because, you know, uh, St. Augustine was a, a military fort, you know, by, run by the United States military. So that's the way we saw it. But it used to be uh, one of our great, when, when the British ruled, we had a lot of, the luxury of coming in here and trading and and uh, getting whatever we needed. But when the war broke out, then uh, everything changed. Is that okay? <laughs> yes, sir. The company that I owned until recently built some major structures for your tribe. And the, the contract itself said that all disputes 
would be settled by the tribal elders, which scared me. It but, it was, <laughs> <laughs> but it was the most peaceful, civilized, we just worked out all the details. It was really one of the most positive experiences I've ever had. But that's good because that, that's the way we want it. We're not, we're not hostile people, you know. If you do what you're supposed to do and get in there and get the job done, then you, you're not going to hear from us, you know. Because we got smart lawyers too, you know. <laughs> you had smart engineers. And smart engineers. And so we, we learned how to play your game, you know. We, we hired the best in each whatever money can buy. Yes, ma'am. How can somebody like me learn authentic Native culture as you teach your own? Authentic? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, gee, I, you know, that, that, that's a right, tough your, your culture. Yeah, yeah. Somebody I, like me learn and know and understand be a part of it. Well, we're kind of, you can, I, I don't want to say you can buy a book because, <laughs> you know, but uh, you just have to move down there where we live and hook up with one of them Indian boys. And, <laughs> Skin an alligator and <laughs> yes, sir. We do have curriculum, and uh, it's based, it's on our, our take on uh, how we develop once we was put on reservation, because we didn't become a federally recognized tribe till 57. 51, we was put on a termination list. We was to be terminated. There was over a hundred tribes because the federal government needed to pay for a war that, and they needed the money. So it was easy to just run the, to kick the Indians off the reservation and uh, sell the land. But our people organized and went to Washington and pitched a fit, you know. You know, give us 25 years and we'll show you. And so, you know how that goes. Right now, we're we're one of the most one of the, the dy dynamic business in the state of Florida right now. We uh, employ over forty thousand people with our gaming and just a tribal tribal business. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. But uh, you, you know, um, we have common ground, you know, and uh, we we uh, we're good buddies with the county sheriffs, and uh, we're good buddies with the uh, county judges, and we all work together. So they they come on a reservation to make arrests, but usually. Our, my tribe has their own police department. It's a lot easier for those boys to go in there and make the arrest in a county. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes. What is the relationship between the tribal land and the Everglades? 
What is the relationship? Well, you know, we only we only have a piece of the reservation uh, Everglades in down in the Big Cypress Reservation, and then the rest of it is owned by the Miccosukees down on 41. So they're a different group, and uh, and uh, they're very much in tune with what's going on with the Everglades, even as much as as catching those big snakes, you know. <laughs> And uh, those, those snakes are not in our culture, but we have a lot of them down there. So, I'm glad, yes, sir. Uh, what annual, uh, annual event that you have according to dancing or ceremonial dancing? Is that something that you have or is it something that you have? And uh, what are some of your social dances that you have? Well, um, like I said, we had the green corn dance. And uh, some of the dances, we do the buffalo, we do the bird dance, and then we do several other, you know, sheep, and uh, crow dance, drunk dance, you know? <laughs> so, we, we try to get all the ceremonial dances in there. When does this happen? It, it, ours is usually late June, early May, you know, you know, right up in there. Hey, Carrie wants an invitation. <laughs> <laughs> you got a clan, you can come. <laughs> I got to go, so thank you very much. <laughs> that all of our questions are a desire to know more. I mean, a desire to really hear from, from you. So thank you, Willie, for answering these questions. And we can certainly have more questions afterwards. Um, I don't want to have a conflation of histories here because the exhibition that you'll see uh, next door is bringing knowledge not only of the Seminole story, but the Chiricahua Apache, the Cheyenne, Comanche, Kiowa, Arapaho, Caddo, that were all here. And um, I know it can sometimes feel overwhelming when this history has only been told orally and it, it isn't in our books, right? So all of you that are here and asking these questions, it's so important. So I thank you for the, the answers and, and for the questions. Um, I want to introduce our final speaker, Edgar Hebeverts, for tonight. Although I'm really tempted to get Harry back up here to answer the question about um, the the warriors and, and um, the code talkers, which is what I sort of heard you alluding to. Um, so, because there, I mean, there's a huge response to that. I mean, just it, it, that's like a whole nother symposium. Um, so, um, Edgar, thank you for your patience. So, let me please introduce Edgar Heap of Birds. He received his MFA from Tyler School of Art in Tem at the Temple University in Philadelphia. He has exhibited his work at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the National Museum of the American Indian, the Smithsonian Institution in New York, and internationally in Germany, France, and the Venice Biennale. His awards include the National Endowment for the Arts, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Louis Comfort Tiffany Foundation, the Lila Wallace Foundation, and the Andy Warhol Foundation. I had to practice this several times. Okay. This is awesome. <laughs> Edgar is also a professor at the University of Oklahoma within Native American Studies, and he has served as a visiting professor at Yale University and the Rhode Island School of Design. He is one of 50 American artists honored by the United States with an individual fellowship award of $50,000 and is named as a Ford Fellow of the Visual Arts. His artwork and efforts as an advocate for indigenous communities worldwide are focused first on social justice and then on the personal freedom to live within the tribal circle as an expressive individual. Please help me welcome Edgar Heap of Birds. Thank you for the welcome. I'm going to get all our technology squared away here. And uh, is that good? Good. Uh, I have a pretty extensive talk prepared uh, today, and uh, I'm going to try to go about 40 minutes with uh, the PowerPoint. 
And then I have a series of short videos to show you from international projects as well. And we'll go into the history and, and my, my early work as a graduate student. I don't often get to do that with uh, my lectures, so I'll be able to show you some of the early work uh, that pertains to this history at Fort Marion and so on. Very been very uh, traumatic and very uh, important to my family and uh, remains so. Um, and uh, the first image here is uh, my grandmother, Huetzio. Huetzio is a lightning woman, and uh, she's holding her baby. And uh, they're both gone now, but, uh, but I wanted to start, uh, first of all, by saying I want to dedicate this talk to indigenous women and, and mothers um, uh, that, that took care of many, many uh, children, many, many families, and continue to struggle. Uh, I'll talk more about that struggle a little bit later. And I wanted to make uh, an acknowledgement to begin. You know, we just read my Vita, part of my Vita, my resume. But I wanted to acknowledge my instructors. I've been involved with uh, in another education parallel to the uh, Master of Fine Arts degree and honorary doctorate degree and whatnot, professorships and so on. And that is in the Cheyenne traditional uh, teachings and ceremonial ways, which goes uh, four years per instructor, which goes into 16 years, uh, and I'm, I'm now an instructor. Um, but I want to acknowledge uh, uh, Paul Hart, Paul Peak Hart, and I wanted to also acknowledge Roy Dean Bullcoming, and I wanted to also acknowledge Vernon Bullcoming, and also acknowledge um, Jasper Washe. Uh, two of those men are, are chiefs and um, uh, mediators, chiefs, and ceremonial instructors, and then two of them are war chiefs, and they're all Cheyenne. So I've been really very, very uh, blessed to be able to have four men uh, carry me through all these years, and they've imparted me with much knowledge, and so now I'm, the, I'm taking care of a young man uh, when, the, when the sun's at its highest point uh, coming up this June. So we, we carry on that way, so I wanted to acknowledge uh, uh, those, those leaders and that help me uh, with what I do, okay? Uh, the first image, as I said, is from uh, my grandmother, uh, Hoetzio, and I want to talk about that history that goes into that life. Um, and the, the Fort Marion experience for us comes out of the, the Washita massacre. So that's why we ended up here and we fought uh, many battles and we fought in Sand Creek, uh, that massacre as well. And this is a piece I did about the Sand Creek, uh, the Washita massacre. And I'm going to read you a text uh, from that day. Many Cheyenne were killed during the fight. The air was full of smoke from gunfire and it was almost impossible to flee because bullets were flying everywhere. However, somehow we ran and kept running to find a hiding place. As we ran, we could see the red fire of shots. We got near a hill and there we saw a steep path where an old road used to be. There was red grass along the path and although the ponies had eaten some of it, it was still high enough for us to hide. In this grass we lay flat, our hearts beating fast, and we were afraid to move. It was now broad daylight and frightened us to listen to the noise and cries of the wounded. When the noise seemed to quiet down and we believed the battle was about to end, we raised our heads high enough to see what was going on. We saw a dark figure lying near a hill, and later we learned it was the body of a shining woman and child. The woman's body had been cut open by the soldiers. That is a quote from a young woman who was 14 years old on the day of the Washita massacre. Her name is Moving Behind, and uh, that was uh, November 27, 1868, and Colonel Custer uh, was leading that massacre of the Cheyenne people. So after that massacre, uh, the tribe was devastated, of course, and uh, the, the, the four principal chiefs, as well as uh, warrior society leaders, war chiefs, were taken prisoner of war, and they ended up in St. Augustine. This is a, a piece I did about 20 foot uh, war installation about the massacre uh, of the Washita. Uh, an elder here again from that era, uh, she was actually a child of that time from the Washita massacre, family member. And I wanted to also um, talk about the, uh, the traits of that, of that uh, massacre and the uh, outcome. Um, uh, there were 53 women and children 
taken hostage after that massacre, Cheyenne women and children. Uh, they kept the men, put them in prison here in Florida, um, but um, they paraded them into a place called Fort Supply. Custer had a fort built for him just to catch the Cheyenne. He couldn't catch the Cheyenne on his own. He almost died once trying to do that in the winter. So they, re they resupplied him in Kansas, I mean from Kansas to Oklahoma, uh, from Leavenworth uh, to a place called Fort Supply. He paraded in with his uh, war trophies, uh, 53 humans, um, and uh, this woman would have been on that same journey uh, as maybe a baby. Um, and I wanted to extend uh, the information that they were also involved with human trafficking. Uh, this is a quote from a uh, man named Ben Clark from that same day, that same era. Many of the squaws captured at the Washita were used by the officers. Romero was put in charge of them, and on the ranch, on, on the march, Romero would send squaws around to the officers' tents every night. Clark says Custer picked out a fine-looking one and had her in his tent every night. So as, I, as a child, a young man, uh, I was pretty startled to know a old lady who had a kind of a prairie bonnet and she was totally uh, white-skinned on the reservation. And I asked my uncle, who was the head you know, ceremonial leader, uh, and she spoke total Cheyenne. And I asked him, who was this lady? And he told me, this, this, this is from a book I just read you, but he told me that story about how they took the women to Fort Supply, raped them, and then brought them back and dumped them off. And so there are many, many children, grown grandmas, uh, maybe great-grandmas, that were from that day. So there were human traffickers that left those ladies back on the reservation. Um, and the stories get worse and worse, but uh, uh, it's kind of a contemporary term to be human trafficker, but it started out with custom. So here are the, the warriors rounded up um, after the Washtenaw Massacre. And then uh, I made a drawing, a large drawing, eight foot by eight foot, when I was in Philadelphia. And uh, they say, here's a young man who looks a lot like me. Uh, I was 25, 26, and uh, just finished the Tata School of Art in Philadelphia. Had my first solo show at 26 in a museum. But to all these words came from Captain Pratt's list, which I found in the Oklahoma Historical Society. And he made a list of his Cheyenne um, uh, prisoners of war. And my name is at the top of the list. Uh, here, a uh, heap of birds, bear shield, Mahnemek and Greybeard was killed on the way, but there were four principal chiefs, so Hebrews was one of the first uh, principal chiefs. So in, in this sensibility of the war, English language, that was a way to capture the Indians too, was the language. And it was something, of course, I've become empowered by the language, I use it in all my work, um, but it was very much a, a prison in itself for the, for the warriors. Uh, we've seen this picture today with them first coming to the very uh, humid, area of, of Florida, very tough for them, and to leave their families. And they were basically held hostage. Uh, there were, there were uh, three forts built in Oklahoma for the Cheyenne uh, to domineer them. And so the people had to maintain a peace with the white citizens in hopes they would ever have their warriors return back to Oklahoma. On the far left has uh, been identified as heap of birds or Muyahun Haskus, uh, many magpies. Um, that, that kind of treatment and that kind of uh, domination, uh, particularly with no law, with no charges, with no due process, uh, no way to uh, 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 confront your accuser, uh, these basic human rights, uh, these native warriors were not allowed any of those rights. And it, might, it may sound uh, gloomingly familiar. These are, uh, this is a photograph from Guantanamo and what's happening right now uh, in, in Cuba. Uh, so I, I feel that America still continues uh, this kind of unilateral brutality, which uh, should really be stopped. Uh, our relationship with the government continues and uh, is sometimes contentious. But uh, I was, I've been here before to, to St. Augustine and, and I find it very necessary to offer the ceremonial pipe every time I come to this, to this part of the world and to pray for all those souls uh, that were lost here in St. Augustine. Um, 
So the government and the native life is a contentious kind of uh, impasse or, or a very con conflicting experience, but I'm hoping to make that uh, not so, to make it more of a collaborative experience. That's one of my favorite drawings uh, by Bear's Heart from the Prisoner of War era, and he's showing you the, um, uh, the onslaught of the, of the army coming with the horses, the cavalry, the guns, and he's moving in a very uh, linear fashion here across the prairie or across the land, and it shows you how it does not go into the circle, it goes into the straight line of, of uh, domination. This is a more practical and more of a ceremonial drawing uh, where uh, this is a making medicine and a, a prisoner of war and uh, Cheyenne, of course. Um, and he actually subverts the page. So it's really wonderful, very, very provocative drawing where he does not acknowledge the square to end. He runs the buffalo up the side of it and they come back around. You know, so a very subversive drawing. Uh, my family from that time, uh, right after that time, so we had the, the main uh, father figure here in the center, uh, Black Wolf, and then his father was Heap of Birds, many magpies. So his father was here in, in uh, St. Augustine. Uh, the little boy on the left is uh, Guy Heap of Birds. And the first slide I showed you, uh, this little boy would grow up and be the husband of that lady. Uh, a lightning Woman. So Guy Hugo Birds married Lightning Woman, and then they had a son. Uh, his name was uh, Many Magpies. He was named after the chief that died here in Florida. Uh, his English name was Charles, and Charles is my dad. You know, so um, it was a very proud family, a lot of leadership. Uh, he was a war chief. A black a black wolf was a war chief, and now I'm a war chief. Uh, this is a drawing from uh, around graduate school time, and I know it's a very old slide, but uh, I want to read some of it. It, it kind of deals with me coming back home in a, in a mythical way, but I had actually returned home to Oklahoma from the East Coast of America. And it's called Last Home, so it says Carlisle Student, Redmond Home, 1854, and then the bottom is Philadelphia Student, which is taught home. 1954. Uh, my name is Hockeyavy in Cheyenne, and so there was a man named Hockeyavy who was many magpies' nephew. He was also in prison here. So we were born 100 years apart, and we both came to the East Coast, um, and we're both called Little Chief, Hockeyavy's Little Chief. Uh, if you can get a detail, we don't have that here, but if you can look deeper into that drawing, it's actually a Xerox copy of Little Chief uh, fighting two Osage Indians. It was one of his letter drawings. So I've been working on these issues of the letter drawings for many. This is from like 19, probably like uh, 78 or somewhere in there. Another drawing I made with some of the same issues of loss was uh, when I learned many magpies died here. He was incarcerated here and he died here. And um, so I made a, made a drawing. This is about a four foot drawing, very early in my career as a young, young artist out of graduate school. It's called Dead House, Dead Man. And there's a detail in the middle of the photograph. And my grandmother, uh, who I showed you the first slide of, she, had a, she was the matriarch and she took care of all of us and I, I really was very close to her, certainly. But her house was at the end of this road at the top of the hill for all my life. And then when she died, uh, someone sold the land and they demolished the house. So for me, it was, a, it was a big major loss to know the man was lost and then know the house was lost. I've also used my own uh, name as part of the subject matter and just in kind of investigating my history, native history, shine history. Uh, this is called Wind of Birds, and uh, my name causes confusion and perplex and it causes trouble. Just being an American, you know, it causes trouble every day. Uh, there's not a lot of respect for native native names and so on, but. Uh, so I combined it with how the West was won. So it says, uh, West of birds, win of birds, one of birds, lost of birds, heap of West, heap of one, heap of one, heap of win, heap of lost. And the, the image in the center is actually my sister's, my cousin's laughing at a powwow. So it's really more about how, you know, we're not the West. We're not really this mythical native world. We're just people, kids laughing. 
And the piece in the show here uh, is Numshum, three times in the exhibit. You'll see that also in my Venice Biennale project in Italy. But uh, uh, So Numshum is his grandfather. And so I did, the, I did these monotypes, monoprints about grandfather. Um, I think a lot of, and grandfather is a big word, goes back into history, or a personal word, Numshum. Uh, here are some of the monotypes I've been working on the last, say, three or four years. Uh, and many of them are political issues, some of them are very personal. I don't show many personal ones tonight, but uh, this is one uh, about the code name, uh, the Apache code name they gave to bin Laden. Uh, ben, uh, so Obama and Hillary Clinton were in the Situation Room. They radioed in that they killed Geronimo, and they got very happy, you know. Uh, but they were actually talking about bin Laden. So when that happens, and you're actually an Apache person in the military, what do you think about that? You know, and you're, you're, you're looking for Geronimo, you're looking, you're looking for Bin Laden, but you're an Apache person. So a uh, very, very horrible kind of targeting. And uh, trying to find some uh, affinity within life as well, and some of the tragedies, but Sand Creek, Shine Massacre, Washtenaw River, Shine Massacre, Sandy Hook, uh, a white massacre of children, and we should more in all the massacres. All the children are precious. I made this uh, about the Washtenaw Massacre. The children were running in the water and were killed in the water in Western Oklahoma. Um, I work with Aboriginal artists in Australia. I do a lot of international projects and we had a major traveling show called 16 Songs from Sydney and Adelaide, Australia. I did residencies there. But uh, we had a public art project uh, mandated for every venue of the uh, exhibit and it was in Cleveland, Ohio, which I had a lot of energy about Cleveland, Ohio. And I made them a special billboard. Here's a billboard. And lo and behold, they said they were offended. They were offended because I had encroached on their trademark. You know. So uh, they told me that they were really were honoring Native people by that, by that image, previous image. That's an honoring image, supposedly. So if he gave it to me, I can alter it. So I made this out of it. And they censored my billboard, uh, the museum, and then we took it to the newspaper, we got a lawyer, uh, and people actually sent in money donating to make more billboards. <laughs> and then the museum later asked me, can, we please, can you please make our billboard? Because you know, they were so ashamed of their behavior. So the public art is there, I do a lot of public art, and it's there to actually generate the discussion. It's, it's not there to solve problems, but it's there to generate this. And it did just generate a lot of discussion in Cleveland, Ohio. I did a series of billboards in Toronto. Uh, Night Blanche was happening in Paris and also Toronto. I think I had a 10 billboards, 20 foot tall, along uh, Queen Street. But uh, a lot of tragedy in, in Canada, as you may know. There, there's huge, huge uh, epidemic of pedophilia. And when you would actually um, uh, abuse a child within the non-native community, and urban, white community, uh, your penalty would be sent to an Indian reservation if you're a clergy. So they send all of these uh, pedophiles out to the reservation. So there's all these huge, huge uh, issues with mental health in Canada. So I made, a, I made a piece, and they call them the Black Robes. And I did bus shelters in, in uh, Vancouver. I did it also in Vancouver. Uh, probably the most uh, important public piece, along with my work in Denver, uh, is called Billy, Minnesota. And uh, Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, uh, executed 38 Dakota warriors. It's pretty much a major hidden part of history. December 26, 1862, McKenna, Minnesota. Execution order by the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. So he actually had them all hung on the same day, a place called Mankato, Minnesota. I made a 400-foot installation. Uh, after Lincoln was assassinated, there were two more uh, hung by Andrew Johnson. And so uh, the reason being that they wanted to take the land and they uh, had the mass execution, the largest in American history. I put this down in Minneapolis, working with the Walker Art Center, and on the horizon are, are Pillsbury and gold metal uh, granaries. And so I used 40 pounds of Pillsbury flour and scribed the art out of flour and then put the science in the flour. Um, I also work with, with middle school students, junior high students, and they helped me uh, put the signs in the ground. These were students who were, who were descendants of the warriors who were executed. 
Um, and um, very important to work with the students and give them that history and visit with the chiefs and the graves that are back on the reservation and so on. Uh, this project will be at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Uh, the opening is in about two weeks. So we are going to actually have this piece, the Abraham Lincoln sign, at the Met. You know, so, so there is hope you know, to change things by having that. I'll be at the Met as well doing projects with the exhibition. Um, I make signs uh, for tribal communities as well. Um, I use a tactic uh, against subversion to take a word like Salt Lake City and then to flip it in, in reverse. And so I'm trying to uh, initiate changing, in a sense, the perception of the viewer or the community to see the past in a different way. So if I could turn Salt Lake City around, the University of Utah, Salt Lake City, Today your host is Nuchi. Nuchi is the real name for the Ute tribe. So again, most of the tribal names are all wrong, and you know, they're errors. So uh, we try to actually uh, make a constructive change there. And these are students at the University of Utah who are very happy to have that sign put up on their campus. I have a, a permanent series of signs at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And this is a Squamish British Columbia, to your host is Squamish. And uh, they put them up in the ground permanently. They've been there for maybe eight years or, or longer. And I have some at the Pitzer College right now in LA. And the president university lives just down this road. He has to go home and thank the Squamish every night when he goes home. <laughs> I've been very happy to also work with tribes in the Caribbean. And I've been working there recently in uh, St. Croix and also St. Thomas. Uh, U.S. Virgin Islands today, your host is Taino, and of course, very overlooked history of the Caribbean nations, and we're looking at the middle past of slavery primarily, and not really acknowledge the lives lost by all the tribes who were in the Caribbean. And uh, my main audience there are the cruise ship people that come to Paradise, but they need to know what happened to Paradise, and we put that up on the beach, and uh, that's St. Croix. I also did a project in San Jose, and usually they, they accompany an uh, exhibit in the museum. This is called Mission Gifts, and it was a project done, uh, as I said, in San Jose, California. And I researched uh, Native life there, and of course it's a very uh, dangerous experience for Native people there. Many deaths uh, to where you don't see anybody really anymore, in a sense, so in the, in the bay itself. So the, the text reads, syphilis, smallpox, forced baptisms, a mission gives any native lives. And again, uh, in this case, the Catholic Church got, got upset and offended, um, but it was really the, the, the clergy that brought the diseases and did the misdeeds. And so uh, even the person that owned the bus company had to say, hey, we've got to take your bus signs off. They've been censored, but we'll take them off very slowly. It'll take a long time. <laughs> So he was actually in favor of the project, and because it took the time to take him off, we got the censorship reversed, and they stayed on for months. Drove all over Bay Area. Uh, this is a, a panel recently done in London, uh, near King's Cross Station, uh, and it's King's Cross, St. Pancreas. Uh, those stations have the Eurostar train. The Eurostar goes to Brussels, and I've taken it many times to Paris myself. Uh, and I wanted to put this up, you know, near the train station because uh, we have to kind of really get down to the thought of uh, the Europeans initiating these uh, horrible deeds here, even in St. Augustine, the Spanish, the British, and whatnot. Uh, here, here are images of the border. So we have the biohazard in the center, and flanking it are actually an actual cross, a Christian cross, which is actually a sword, and it's really a, an icon I found in research. Uh, we put this up, I think it's about a 30 foot banner, and deals with the, the lives lost. Uh, and in England, they call you the Red Indian, you know, to differentiate between India and uh, the USA. So they call me a Red Indian. And so the, the uh, actual estimation of lives lost, I went for the low number, 25 million in the hemisphere from so called contact, uh, but also it goes up to 100 million of lives lost. I also made public art in Atlanta, kind of not too far from here, and um, I was working with uh, 
Uh, they went out of College of Art and had a show inside of the museum and also worked on the street, on Peachtree Street. And of course I'm very aware of being from Oklahoma and hearing um, the talk about the Seminole just a few minutes ago. And the Trail of Tears, which began uh, early in, the, in that 1800s. Um, so I made, uh, I think, four or five panels about the Trail of Tears. I put them up all along the uh, Peachtree Street in downtown Atlanta. And I was very happy to have the Rodin stand in as a tarred walker. <laughs> Uh, do you choose to walk? Were you forced to walk? Trail of Tears, 1836, walked Oklahoma. And it's kind of a satire in a sense because I know there's, uh, like today there was a really great aerobics class went on downstairs, you hear the beat going on. And you want to do some power walking, well, try walking to Oklahoma from here. You'll be very fit by the time you get there. And so, so I thought that walking is a penalty, it's not just exercise. So they had to walk from here, Florida to, or Georgia to Oklahoma. A major penalty with no none of your belongings and leaving your leaving your home. Uh, I put pyramids in the gallery, and another a misnomer is the lack of respect for the pyramids in the Americas, in the North America. We have a lot to deal with in terms of respecting. We do have that respect for Mexico, Titiwakan, uh, Uxmal, Mitla, so forth, Tikal, but there are major pyramids in in North America went across the river from St. Louis, but uh, these are from uh, a place called Old Mogi, which is very much a Creek tribal place, and so I built two of the pyramids in the gallery. I used uh, the ceramic designs to embellish the pyramids, and students helped me. And I guess one of the things, again, with language is very important, uh, language being degrading, and so all the pyramids in North America are called mounds, see? And when you go to Egypt, you don't, you don't call the pyramids in Egypt a mound, you know? Uh, so they just can't really uh, uh, come to grips with North American tribes creating these vast pyramids, which they did. Uh, speaking of those kind of earthworks, I want to show you the medicine wheel in Wyoming, a big horn wheel. Um, Goes back to Cheyenne, Arapahoe, Shoshone, Crow, Sioux, uh, many tribes in the Northern Prairie come to this site and make their earth renewal. And I've been a student of that site and I've been there with my two sons multiple times. Um, and I want to show you uh, a star map. Um, and I guess by and large, I would have to say that most images that are identified as Native American are not a aesthetic not a design form to look nice. Uh, they've been co-opted to become that. I mean, Coco Pelli is co-opted, you know, in New Mexico. But it's not the real thing. Uh, and so these uh, stones placed in the ground are actually uh, scientific observations and notations like any scientist would make with a telescope or with a computer uh, and from many, many hundreds of years ago. So you have Cirrus, Regal, uh, summer solstice, equinox, and that's where those lines are setting up in that relationship. The lines of wealth stones. Now, if you took those same stones, uh, this is a template of that piece, uh, you would actually come forward maybe 500 years today to today, more recent times, and you would take these stones, the same formation, and create a lodge with the rafters in the same position as these stones. So they're setting up the same stars, Polaris, uh, the equinox, uh, all the, the major systems above us that we all, that we all live with. And um, uh, that, that lodge is the Renewal Lodge for the Earth. And so it's active, uh, it's activated in the, in the summer solstice era, time of year, um, all those tribes, share the same religion from Blood, Sarsi, uh, Shoshone, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Sioux, uh, many, many tribes, even, even going back to the day when the uh, uh, Kiowa Comanche would have done it too. Uh, so I want to talk about that, that form, but primarily the, the fork pole that holds up the universe. Uh, this is my sculpture in Denver, it's called Wheel. And it's about a 10-year project. The budget was $600,000. Um, 
had funding from the National Endowment of the Arts and Bell Telephone and other major corporations and foundations. Um, and it's a permanent installation in Denver, in front of the Denver Art Museum. And we're setting these, these trees on the same radii that uh, vector in the star systems. It's a 50-foot installation, and they're made of steel and porcelain, very heavy. Uh, there's, a, there's a frame underground, uh, six feet, so it's 18 feet in total, 12 feet above ground. And so they're just there to support activities of Native people. So they're the fork poles that support the universe. And there's an autobiographical story of, of, the, of the West, in the sense of the uh, prairie and the middle of uh, the Southwest as well. So. Um, you have uh, actually the, the, the images of many magpies right here. Uh, those are magpie birds flying. And then you have Fort Marion on the, on the far right indicated on that tree. So it goes into prehistory and then into reservation life and uh, some peaceful times in the 1830s going forward into uh, uh, some assim assimilation, I guess, and, but then education and empowerment and returning back to the reservation and becoming immersed in the ceremonial life. Uh, so it's a piece that was uh, commissioned, it was completed in 2005, and I want to show at the end of my talk tonight uh, like a three minute video of us actually installing this piece uh, in the ground in Denver. And my, my thought toward uh, Fort Marion, I'm here doing some research right now to initiate hopefully someday a sculpture of this magnitude here in St. Augustine, uh, using the names of all the I work with children a lot, so my youth group came from uh, Shine Arapaho Nation, and we came to Denver. Uh, at the top, uh, the text, not care for ASM, not care for ASM, means we always come back, we always turn around in Cheyenne. My grandmother, lightning woman, saying that with you all. And so uh, this piece of land is was once a Shining Reservation, now it's called Denver, Colorado. But uh, we come back and hold that land with the sculpture. And the students made their own drawings about the sculpture, the fork poles. And then, uh, probably my most gratifying uh, uh, reaction or reflection is that every year when they have the, the remembrance of the St. Creek Massacre, they have a run uh, youth run from Oklahoma to, to Colorado. They go through Sand Creek and they take turns running on, on that journey uh, to remember the, the dead. Um, they come and they stop that wheel and they have a candlelight vigil at wheel. And so I'm not there, I'm not, I don't initiate that. They just know that's a good, safe, circular place, Cheyenne place. And uh, in a sense, they finish the talk for me. They finish the talk by their vigil. And they had a, two busloads of Shine Rappos came this, this November. Uh, with the youth, I talked to them about the axis, uh, the medicine wheel, and we look at this, uh, these points from the solstice. So this would be the summer solstice, the black northeast, the big sunny day, the biggest day, sets in the northwest, the short day, the winter, uh, southeast, setting southwest. So that's the axis that you need to know if you're in the middle of the prairie. If you know that axis, you know the, the extremes of, of, first of all, the, the wild, the, the, the plants, then the animals follow the plants, and the people follow the animals. So the whole system goes with just the simple sun, how it moves, and when it's time to get ready for winter, get ready for summer. Uh, so it means everything to me, this, this means everything to me, this, this, this form. Uh, we did drawings with that form, and then some of the students were going to complete their, their piece by making uh, their own kind of autobiography inside of the, the medicine wheel. That was at Concho, Oklahoma. Uh, then I was asked to also make a uh, mural for the new uh, gymnasium on the reservation. It's a location called Canton, Oklahoma. And so uh, they play basketball there, they have powwows inside, hand games, and so forth. But I really wanted to uh, address the youth that come to the powwows, but come to the, play basketball. And so I took an elder's work, uh, 
Melvin Blackman, who's now deceased. And I took his beadwork, which was only about four inches tall, I did a contact scan with a major uh, technological scanner, and we created a, a multicolored print that made the, the four inch beadwork like six feet tall. And so we made two murals uh, with ghost dance songs from the Arapaho, um, and these were, they're, they're put up permanently on the reservation. And, and hopefully the students will think about not only dunking the ball, but doing beadwork this good. Uh, that's my studio in Oklahoma City, uh, where I make my paintings and so forth, and drawing. Here's the print from Cleveland. Excuse me. Um, I want to show you some of the painting. So the Earth uh, is where I got, you know, most of my inspiration. Also the ocean, but uh, initially the Earth was so key to me. Walking on the reservation for 15 years, 10 years, hunting. But these trees were what really gave me uh, a vision, although it was very subliminal. It was something I just found as I worked. I didn't know I wasn't even making it. I just made these shapes. The shape, if you look at the shape here, kind of this aggressive looking cedar tree, and then you see my shapes. Um, I painted probably for four years without knowing I was making that tree, you know, because I was in the land, in the moment, so much. Uh, living on the reservation on top of this canyon. Uh, so, and I, so I continue this, this journey with the paintings uh, over 20 years. Uh, they're called Nuf Four, do something four times. I paint four of them at a time. And uh, these are probably from the 90s. Uh, and I painted up in Maine on Bar Harbor. And I made these four paintings on the barn wall. I'm painting inside of the barn. Uh, this is a, a big show, a miniature show I had at the Pomona Museum of Art in L.A., uh, part of uh, Claremont. And uh, these are all blue, so I've got more involved right now to do kind of monochromatic, um, limiting myself to blues and uh, greens. And we were working with water, water as a concept, some elders from the Tongva tribe. So I made four paintings. And so you put down one shape, and then another shape, and another shape, and another shape. And so it's very organic, the way it builds. And uh, when I get to a, a point, I call it having a truce. I mean, I, I don't say I, I control this painting. I, 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 make, I make a truce with it, and we stop. You know? So it has to have its own spirit. And painting for an artist, a painter, uh, you're always painting. It never, it never ends until you, until you end. You know, so people stop it every now and then and say, that's a painting and that's an ex exhibition. But uh, I'm painting again right now, so um, it's, a, it's an ongoing investigation. Those are all the blue pieces. And uh, I've been born in the tropics. I, I was in, uh, near Bali. This is a Bali volcano in, in, by Java. And I was out on the, on the water snorkeling. So the water is very important to me, the water itself. I also worked with students in Java, and we did winter installation pieces in Javanese language and also English language, and that was a great residency I had in Java. But um, I was very excited to get in the water, and that's the reef uh, near a place called Lumbach, and I was there researching fabric. I like to collect fabric and make vests and so on. And I was there uh, to be with the fish and the coral. Uh, these are uh, four new paintings, very tiny paintings about this size. I just finished them in Hawaii. I was in Oahu on the North Shore painting with my family and I made these four blue paintings. Um, and really trying to work with the paint without white because white can be very easily, the color can actually can be very easy to set up a contrasting dynamic. So it's very difficult to use one color like blue and get it all to uh, hold its space. Uh, these slides will give you an idea of how they build. So that's an early shot of those four paintings that were kind of autumn colors. And then you'll see them get more shapes on them. And these are when they're finished. So uh, they're all kind of reds and uh, I'm back in making more reds now. I'm back home in Oklahoma. I'm painting them in my studio right now uh, in Oklahoma. But the shapes have to all have special kind of personalities. And I find that the shape is good when it has its own, when it's an entity, when it has its own spirit. So I work hard on making those shapes from those trees and from those fish and 
Uh, I guess it's an abstract way. And also, of course, certainly, it's not a billboard, it's not a massacre, it's not um, a, a kind of a polemical discussion. Uh, they're hard to do, but uh, I find them to be more celebratory. Uh, this piece will go into the Venice Biennale. Uh, some of the last slides I'll show tonight, and then we'll go to the video pieces. But uh, I was chosen to do uh, a uh, collateral project with the National Museum of American Indian Smithsonian Institution in the 07 Biennale in, in Venice, Italy. And this is the, the grave of Long Wolf in Brompton Cemetery in London. So I do a lot of work with more memorial, my public work. Uh, here is a Long Wolf, a Sioux warrior and his family. Uh, they were taken from South Dakota after Wounded Knee. Um, and they were, some of them were actually in prison uh, in uh, Fort Sheridan outside of Chicago. And they were, again, held hostage by the USA like the Fort Marion prisoners of war were. Uh, so people could actually be held in check on the reservation. Uh, so Buffalo Bill came and he actually, in a sense, rented them for $20,000, uh, a series of families and men, and took them to his Wild West shows in Europe. He bonded them out of prison. Uh, so I made a series of memorials. Um, the, the treatment of Buffalo Bill's, uh, well, his, his behavior toward the, his tribal people that he rented was very, very poor. So there were over 20 people died in Europe and they're buried all over Europe from Moscow to Barcelona to Marseille, London, Paris. Uh, I, did, I did original research and found uh, 15 uh, death sites. And so I, I honored uh, each warrior with a panel in Venice. Uh, they came to Venice to promote their Wild West show. And the show later was in Verona. Uh, after our exhibit closed in, in Venice, they went to Verona by the Colosseum where they actually uh, ex exhibited their Wild West show. Uh, so honor the death of Numshum, grandfather, Long Wolf Remitare. Remitare is to remember, lament, you know, miss. Uh, so again, memory, uh, loss. Here's a photograph of some of the warriors and uh, the little boy at the bottom as well. The deaths uh, range from adults, males, to uh, baby girls. And so it's a very, very sad tale uh, and how they were kind of driven out of the Americas because of wounded knee. If they ask you what you want to do, go to, they say, oh, well, I show you want to stay in South Dakota. Well, I'll, go to, you know, I'll go to Europe. And you didn't know what it was, but um, that's how tough America was in, in that time. Um, my last part of the Biennale in Venice was, was, was the most wonderful part, and that was uh, to create blown glass in Murano. Murano is a major island uh, right next to Venice, and it's a glass blowing, I guess, center of the world, or the universe, I would think. Um, so these are the vases that I created, and uh, I made them actually with the bodies uh, going across. There are 16 bodies drifting around. Uh, the vases, and, and I brought some cards here, uh, they're out front here, and if you want to have them, they're free, and, and uh, there's also some stuff about the, the piece at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and whatnot down, down below there. Um, and here's uh, the vase on fire here, too. So what I want to do is to go now into the video of making the, the, the glasswork. It's about a three minute piece, I think. So. I think I have to re reset it here. And this, this, it comes in a book, there are some available up here, and the book has the video in it, and there's also three different chapters, but I'm going to show you the, uh, the flash blowing segment. It was produced by the Smithsonian, the book. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
the market drives us to create one kind of medium. So glass is a new one for me, but I'm bringing my painting sensibility to it.
consider describing yourself or some other experience with, with three words. What I want you to think about is um, how we look at each other, and particularly if you can use your imagination and look into the gallery where the captain paintings are and all those faces of Native American people. Um, we go to, to see those faces, but yet they're looking back at us. Uh, and none of the faces are smiling. None of them have much emotion. And so he's edited out the humanity of those human beings. And Native American people are very humorous. They joke, they tease, they laugh, they, they get mad, they cry, they don't, but none of those paintings are doing that. So he's edited out the whole life, uh, which has become a standardized view that Native folks are stoic and quiet, and it is totally a fraud. They're not. So uh, that'll be in the middle of 
middle of uh, March. Um, and then I'd like to give you a two-minute piece from L.A., from Pitzer College. Uh, kind of a new piece here. Language is very simple and very direct and very quick. I really enjoy kind of infiltrating someone's psyche. You know, I guess getting in their head <laughs> in a split, maybe less than a second. You know, that, that they see it, it's already there, and they're wondering. And, and, and the idea that being art or not being art, well, it's too late to worry about that. These particular pieces, they're called native hosts. Here in the Tongva Nation is really the, the, the critical kind of community that we're all being hosted by, along with the nation's sacred sites, which are remarked in all the sign pieces. There's 20 pieces I created for the Pitzer campus. We invited Edgar to be the inaugural artist in residence for a multi-year program we're doing here that's funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, focused on art and environment. And we invited Edgar to create a public art installation for us. The first point of all these efforts in public art is what I call a puncture. You, know, you want to puncture the society. You, you prep them and they, and they wonder, what, what, what's going on here? You know, the California's backwards, uh, there's a native word. Well, I want to, uh, in some ways, uh, cause a bit of, of uh, emotion of being perplexed, maybe, that, that you're wondering. And then once you wonder, you might start to investigate. Here, he identified sacred places, mountains, rivers, village sites, and I thought it actually fortuitously worked out beautifully for what we were wanting to do about making artworks that involved the environment. I hope that the Pitzer students and staff and faculty, uh, that they come through this campus and that they, they wonder about the tribal identity that they're actually walking over. That they wonder about the sacred sites. They, they wonder, well, what is that word? It's a, it's a foreign word. But here they are in Native America, and why is that a foreign, foreign word that this is the place it all starts? Now, in that picture, I was guided by a Tongva elder who helped me go through the whole project and identify the sites. And uh, we're going to actually have uh, the college going to collect four of the, of the 20 panels that indicates the four sacred mountains of the Tongva nation uh, that are in LA. Uh, this is the last offering I'll give tonight, and it's a three-minute piece on the Denver sculpture called Wheel, and it'll give you an idea how we created this major project uh, with, the, with the frames and the exterior uh, porcelain and steel uh, as well. And um, uh, the, the, te the, the uh, music is from a uh, group called Red Bull, and uh, they're a group in Canada. And I like to think about that, how the wheels go to Canada as well. And it's, uh, it's a piece that I'd that I like to uh, be this ambitious uh, for, for St. Augustine.
So I hope to someday be able to offer that this kind of a work of that magnitude to honor the families and warriors that came to be incarcerated here at St. Augustine. So thank you. Uh, just four years ago, I was um, checking out a file at the St. Augustine Archives, and the last name that I checked that file out was Edgar Heapworth, and I thought, I hope I get to meet you someday, and this is so <laughs> wonderful to be at the same table with you. Right. So we have um, educational materials at the back of the room, um, also online. Contact Julie at the museum if you have um, any interest in seeing the video recordings from the day um, and where the show will travel from here. Um, it's going to North Carolina, to Wisconsin, and to Oklahoma, traveling backwards, right, from Florida to Oklahoma, so we're very excited about that. I'm looking for questions of maybe five minutes or something, or of course, yes, maybe yes. our responses, and there's also work below here if you have to take any of that home. But. Yes? Well, one example, he's talking about the, uh, the narrative being a, a non-native methodology and the abstract or the uh, uh, performative, like an example would be, you might see a lot of paintings of, of native people dancing and that, uh, I don't think any shines are many people dancing. I mean, they did it, they did it when they were in prison <laughs> to sell to people in Fort, Fort Marion. I mean, saying last thing, uh, you, you would go dance. You don't have to have a painting of yourself dancing. You go dance, you know. So, so usually the narrative is just something to 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 uh, display culture, you know. So all the objects and the ceremonies, all those uh, forms, uh, plants, uh, animal material, they're all imbued with with the abstract traits that are necessary to complete. But they're not they're not they're not diagrams of the action. They they are a deer tail. They are eagle plume. They're not a painting of an eagle plume, it's an eagle plume, you know. And you have to have it. You can't have a painting of it, it's worthless a painting of it. You need to have it to activate other forms of spirit. So so I, I just find that that's, that that's the way it all works that I know about in my training. So all the other things are just mainly like uh, voyeuristic forms about Indians. You know. Which is the business. Reminds me of the Chinese Ai Weiwei and that's his name. Do you know of him or have you studied Contemporary artists? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I don't think so, not at all. I've been in China, but I don't know. Yes. yes. So much of Florida has been damaged with the environment. You had suggested perhaps an installation or a form of leaving a fingerprint or footprint as you would in St. Augustine, did you have any specific area or concept in mind for healing the earth? Um, yeah, I've got, I've got some initial ideas. I don't know if I would stick to those, but I've been thinking about it for a few years. And I, um, I'm, drawing, I'm drawing the shells, shells. And, and within a shell, depends on when you find it, it's empty or it's alive. You know, there's loss or there's uh, construction, you know, from the life of it, you know, so. And, and I know that tribes uh, along the bay and also the ocean, it was, it was a prosperous time to have these big giant mounds of shells. That meant that you, were, you had food. And, and of course, we track many communities of tribal life along, along the oceans with the mounds of shells. Then you know where the community was. And, and so I'm, I, initially I think about, think about shells. Yes? Hi, you mentioned the pyramids. Um, hmm. Where are they located and are they burial grounds? Um, well, some of them are burial grounds. and. Uh, but the, most of them are, are about astronomy. They're about stars, solstice, and so they're, and they're all over. They're all over. They're all over the Ameri North America, from St. Louis to Georgia, you know, uh, Tennessee, 
um, all over the country, Ohio, Iowa, you know, they're, they're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Well, that can be told about too about Egypt that there's burials, but it's mm -hmm. it's got other yes. broader kind of you know ramifications as but well. But there are literally large mounds and large hills where um, the ancestors were buried. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not, but, but I'm also very, when I work, you know, as you can tell from in L.A. and Tongva tribe and all around the world, I, I work with the community, you know, so when I, when I come to work, I come to listen. I don't come to make, you know, I come to listen. So it would be what the community is considering, wanting, you know, they're a big part of uh, what I would make. It's what, what people are thinking here. It's, 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 a, it's an important question, but it's, a, it's also a very private one. It's not really one for this forum, you know. Uh, my, my colleague here wouldn't really discuss it, and earlier today it wasn't, it wasn't really being more transparent either. That, that if, if you would come to the community and spend time, you know, and particularly if you give to the community and then exchange, Rather than extract, that it's, it's, it's about the kind of relationship you'd make to get to know to get, have knowledge. It's, it's kind of about this uh, sharing rather than taking. You know, so but, but people will give you that knowledge if you come and but it takes more time and attention. So. Common ground. Yeah. yeah. I'm Jennifer Hall. I'm from Minnesota. Any other feedback or other questions or tonight?